Thank you for joining us for the Oxford Internet Institute's webinar today, The Risks of Trusting AI for National Defence Purposes, featuring Dr. Rosaria Tadeo, Senior Research Fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute and Deputy Director of the Digital Ethics Lab and a Faculty Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute, in conversation with Andreas Samadovs, a Research Assistant at the Digital Ethics Lab. A little housekeeping, we are fortunate to have a varied audience with a wide range of views and we request the opinions of others are respected in this space. For your awareness, this event is being recorded and will be posted on our website following the event. There will be time for a Q&A session at the end. Please do pose any questions using the Q&A tab at any time and keep questions as concise as possible. These will be visible to all attendees and the audience can upvote questions if they wish. Please allow me to introduce Rosaria and Andreas. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, good to be here. Uh, very excited about this uh, talk today, um, especially because in the past uh, two, three years, there's been uh, a lot of um, uh, ethical principles uh, on AI published by national governments, by uh, defense agencies, and some of them, without pointing fingers, uh, do ring a bit um, uh, hollow. So it's uh, it's uh, reassuring to know that somebody like uh, Dr. Tadeo is working closely uh, uh, with some of those organizations uh, to guide them through this uh, complex uh, new uh, reality. So uh, Dr. Tadeo uh, is a uh, leading cybersecurity expert and philosopher working on uh, the ethics of digital technologies. She's currently a senior uh, research fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute and the deputy director of the Digital Ethics Lab uh, here uh, at the University of Oxford. She's also recently been uh, appointed as a Defense Science and uh, Technology Laboratory Ethics Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute, where she's leading a research project on the ethical implications of the use of data science and AI for national security and defense. Finally, uh, Dr. Tadeo uh, has also recently became a um, member um, officially representing the UK um, of the exploratory team on operational ethics uh, established by NATO's science uh, and technology organization. And finally, if I may, uh, she's also an amazing thesis supervisor from what I hear. Um, so I only have a few minutes, so I, I will not go over her extensive list of uh, publications, but uh, you can find her work on the ethics of cyber conflict, the ethics of AI, norms of cyber, uh, cyberspace, deterrence, AI for social good, and so much more online and in practically every major academic uh, journal. So uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Tadeo, if you're ready. Uh, thank you so much, Andres, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us here today. And I should say a special thank you to uh, Isabel and Flora, who have organized and are supporting uh, this webinar uh, so far in an excellent way. Um, let me just start by sharing my screen uh, so that we can delve immediately into uh, the talk today. So uh, the topic of the talk is um, trust in AI for cybersecurity. Uh, and whether that's actually a good or a bad um, thing. We can say that AI, as we shall see, um, supports a lot uh, cybersecurity practices, but trusting AI with del delivering these tasks uh, come with quite a few risks, which if left under control can lead to disastrous um, consequences. Before delving into the talk, um, I would like to uh, just clarify since the beginning what I'm going to mean for AI uh, or by AI for the rest of this talk. Um, there is a lot of hype, uh, quite some uh, scientific drive uh, towards the uh, understanding of AI, and I rather make sure that um, this talk remains within the boundaries of uh, research uh, and um, scientific um, scientifically supported analysis. So for the rest of this talk, uh, I will refer to AI as a growing resource of interactive and autonomous self-learning self agency, which can be used to perform tasks that would otherwise require human intelligence to be executed successfully. Now, 
there are two parts to this definition uh, that I would like to stress. The first one has to do with the kind of intelligence we're talking about. AI is not intelligence, in, intelligent in the way a human might be intelligent. We're talking about a machine which is able to perform tasks that if I were to perform them, you would think I had some form of intuition of intelligence in that sense. AI just pretend to be intelligent in this respect. The other aspect of this definition has to do with the kind of resource we're dealing with. AI is an interactive, autonomous, self-learning form of agency. And this is quite unique. It's a form of technology that we have never seen before in the history of humankind. It is this ability to learn and adapt its own behavior autonomously without direct intervention to the environment that makes AI quite unique. And this is also where uh, a lot of ethical policy uh, problems stem. Um, and part of this we're gonna, are gonna be the focus of the talk um, today. So my slides seem not to be working, just bear with me. Uh, the idea of the talk today, let me start again. Uh, the, the idea of the talk today is to um, go over, um, to go over a few key points. One is understanding as a starting point, the um, kind of ethical challenges that AI brings about. Let's see if it works again. The kind of ethical challenges that AI uh, brings about. From them, from there, um, focus a bit more on what are the tasks and the role uh, that AI um, uh, offers or can have in cybersecurity. And then focus finally on trust and what does it mean to have a trustworthy AI systems delivering cybersecurity tasks. And um, by then, uh, as a way of concluding, a conclusion, focusing more on um, an alternative to this kind of trust-based approach to AI, focusing on developing reliable um, AI. So what are the ethical challenges that I would like to um, stress today? Um, this image here comes from a paper that we published um, a couple of years ago in Science Robotics. Uh, focus just on the blue um, circles. They identify uh, five ethical challenges that AI brings about. Um, they go from enabling human wrongdoing, um, reducing human control, remove uh, human responsibility, de devaluing human skills, and eroding human self-determination. Now, some of these challenges, three in particular, um, are relevant when we think about uh, the use of AI for cyber defense or even more broadly cybersecurity um, purposes. Let me start with this one. Um, AI is a complex system, which in many, case, um, many cases still remain a kind of a black box, a system over which we don't have transparency, over which once the architecture is defined and the inputs are provided, it's very hard for us to predict the outcomes or to maintain control. Yet we use AI to support a lot of decision processes which have a strong impact on our societies and on us as individuals. So there is a trust component on AI which is not matched, as you were, um, with our understand, understanding and control of this technology. And this gap is very problematic, uh, for one thing, because it does not allow to understand when problems will emerge. So it does not allow us to have in place mitigating measures um, uh, in a timely fashion. The other um, challenge comes with this approach of um, humanizing AI, kind of anthropomorphize AI. Uh, the idea of seeing in AI a, a different form, but a similar form of humanity. Uh, I put Rachel here, I'm sure that many of you have watched uh, Blade Runner. Well, Rachel is an AI, uh, she is an artificial agent, but she thinks uh, she is a human. She has recollection of feelings, of pains and joy. Um, we should make sure that this confusion between human and artificial intelligence remain within the domain of sci-fi and that we restrain and we stay away from it when it comes to um, ethical analysis and policy analysis of AI in and of itself. This is crucial and it's a mistake that um, or a temptation that has been uh, uh, quite uh, impeding on some contests. For example, the European Parliament a few years ago suggested that we would grant legal personhood um, to uh, artificial intelligence so that we could hold it accountable when something would go wrong. But this is problematic because, uh, and misleading because we should keep in mind that failures as well as successes of AI remain human responsibilities. And the problems with ascribing responsibilities for the actions of AI call for a different framing of our understanding of what moral responsibility is and how to attribute it 
rather than to um, make AI a new form or something similar uh, uh, to uh, any kind of um, humanness that we might think of. The last ethical challenge, which is relevant in the context of cybersecurity, has to do with, has to do with the impact on AI, of AI on our skills. Um, we delegate to AI a lot of tasks. Some of those are boring, some of those are diminishing, some of those are uh, just dangerous. Uh, and it's fine, but we have to make sure that in delegating the task, we don't give up the skills. We still want AI to be able to land planes and to read X-ray, but we also want to be able to read those X-ray and uh, land plane by ourselves, because otherwise we won't be able to know when AI makes a mistake and we won't be able to intervene when AI stop working. Now, these three challenges become very, very important when we think about um, the kind of task and the roles that AI takes in cyber um, security. And this is the second part of, um, of the talk. This is a picture that uh, is quite famous for those who work uh, in cybersecurity, and it's not uh, an up-to-date picture. It's actually a picture from 2014. Uh, it was quite famous at the time. Um, the picture is a snapshot uh, of a dynamic map showed on NORSA website, uh, NORSA being a cybersecurity firm, uh, firm which tracks the traffic on the internet. Now, the map shows more than 4,000 cyber attacks going on in the span of one minute. And it was quite staggering to notice this kind of traffic uh, at the time. And when observing it, one would think, well, actually, this was six years ago um, when we, we were not prepared to cybersecurity, when we didn't know, know uh, from where attacks would come from, what they would target, how impactful they could be. We must have gone uh, onto a better situation, onto a better place these days. I'm afraid that's not really uh, the case, unfortunately. So last year, in 2019, uh, the global risk report uh, produced by the World Economic Forum ranked cyber attack, attacks among the top five sources of severe global risk. We're still there. And numbers support this kind of, um, uh, uh, of fundings. Uh, in the first half of 2018, cyber attacks compromised 4.5 billion records. Um, and this number is uh, almost the, um, twice the amount of the records um, compromised in the year before. Uh, Microsoft, uh, in a report in 2018, tells us that 60% of the attacks last less than one hour, they rely on informal malware, and they can be really, really effective. So we know that AI, sorry, cybersecurity is uh, still a very challenging area. Cyber attacks are escalating in terms of frequency, impact, and uh, sophistication. One of the reasons why this is the case is because of the nature of cyberspace, um, the strategic, as you were, nature of cyberspace. Attacking in cyberspace, especially those attacks that do not cause physical consequences, but that can impair the functioning of a system or that can extract data from a specific system, um, they are quite easy to launch. It's quite easy to acquire relatively sophisticated capabilities, Attribution is very problematic, so it's quite likely for the attacker to remain anonymous and therefore unpunished. But more, of, more than anything, attacks are quite likely to succeed because defenses in cyberspace remain porous. Sooner or later, depending on how much time, how much effort, how much money one has, uh, the attack will be successful. Uh, and this makes cyberspace, what is called in technical, in technical terms, a, a offense persistent environment is an environment in which it's not a given that every attack will be successful, but the chances are so high that it's always worth attacking. And so defense and offense are in a constant contact. This is why, for example, we witness um, phenomena like the um, weaponization of cyberspace or the cyber harm race, where basically a lot, a lot of actors are trying to acquire an offensive capability to use them um, against their opponent or enemies. This creates a dynamic, uh, a vicious circle, as you were, uh, which foster more attacks, which foster more aggressive, um, uh, more and more aggressive behavior. Now, AI can play uh, a key role in this context and can play a role which is um, supporting cybersecurity practices, both technically and strategically. Technically, because AI can help uh, into making systems more resilient to attack um, and so reduce their vulnerabilities and strategically because in making system more resilient, as it were, it can alter this balance between offense and defense. And so discourage attackers a bit more uh, than they have been so far. And this is actually what we uh, have been observing in the past few years. And by now we know that 
when it comes to cybersecurity, uh, AI can play three fundamental um, roles. It can help with system robustness. So AI can help with identifying uh, bugs, problems with the systems, um, thanks to forms of uh, self-testing and self-healing. Uh, it can help with system response. We can have AI systems which are able to identify attacks, but also respond to them, to set up Honeypot, lure attacker in, study their behavior, and then improve security, for example, but even counter incoming attacks. Um, this is not really sci-fi, it's something that has been experimented in 2016 at the um, DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge, and some form of, using, of uses of AI for response to attack are already available on the market uh, by major private um, security company, companies. Um, the last form is uh, the use of AI for uh, system resilience. And this is one of the most common uses of AI. Uh, in so far, this is what allows um, cyber security analysts, cyber security analysts um, to save time and effort uh, in monitoring the behavior of a system um, to spot incoming attacks. Uh, basically, AI can be used to um, identify threat um, and flag them up so that they can be isolated and uh, possibly um, uh, overcome quite easily. Now, each of these three uh, areas of uses of AI um, comes with some kind of ethical uh, problems or um, ethical risk. In the case of the use of AI for system robustness, well, the risk is to give up the skills. You remember uh, using AI to uh, perform tasks that we won't like to, to, to do, but do, doing that without giving up our skills is a key challenge here. Well, it's even more so in the case of cybersecurity. Uh, if we delegate AI to AI the process of uh, verification and validation, we might risk uh, losing these abilities from the human side of the uh, cybersecurity analyst team. The second skill, uh, the second problem has to do with responsibility. Um, if AI is going to respond to attacks, if AI is going to identify vulnerabilities in other systems and use them strategically to launch attacks so that we can defeat our opponent, and if he does that without uh, human supervision, if he does that autonomously, well, who's going to be responsible for this action? Who's going to be held accountable and responsible if something goes wrong? How do we make sure that responses remain, for example, proportionate to the initial offense, the initial attack? And final, um, finally, using uh, AI for system resilience poses serious risk for uh, the individual rights of the users of that kind of system and open the way to forms of mass surveillance. In order to identify a threat in a system, AI has to be able to monitor the functioning of the system. So any sorts of communication, any sorts of interactions, any sorts of information that goes in and out of the system. So that when something that happens that is not entirely into the average working in the system, that can be flagged up. But this monitoring is very, very risky in terms of respecting individual rights such as privacy, anonymity, um, and might actually open the way, as I was saying, to forms of mass surveillance. Now, these are kind of macro level uh, or risks that are kind of a high level, uh, which require policy and which require, require ethical consideration while designing AI, but also while um, understanding how to deploy it in the best possible way uh, into a specific system. There is one more problem, uh, which is more specific and has more to do with the very nature of AI. And this is um, the trustworthiness of this um, technology. Now, there is a lot of uh, uh, focus around trust and trustworthiness, um, a narrative, as we shall see in a moment, uh, has been pushed around these two um, concepts. Today I take this webinar as a chance also to clarify a little bit technically, uh, from a conceptual point of view, what trust is, what trustworthiness is, how they differ, why they are important, and what kind of opportunities and risks they bring uh, about. So, because AI can help with uh, cybersecurity tasks in those three ways, um, as we saw before, uh, there is a lot of um, uh, there are a lot of efforts. There is a lot of push, as it were, uh, internationally to develop AI to support cybersecurity and cyber defense. So, for example, in the US, we had the executive order on AI, which was focusing exactly on this uh, on this goal. The European Commission Cybersecurity Act uh, is open to forms of um, implementation of AI to support cybersecurity um, and the guidelines uh, for AI that the Commission issued last year, while now focusing specifically on the cybersecurity sector, they um, supported this idea of AI as a 
trustworthy tool that can be used uh, um, across all sectors of society. Um, and in 2017, um, the IEEE report uh, on the development of standards for AI in cybersecurity also was stressing um, the, the great impact that AI has in this area. Now, these four documents have something in common, which is the strong um, underlining of the need of trusting AI for cybersecurity and cyber defense uh, purposes. And this is all fine in terms of establishing a narrative, but when we think about trust from a conceptual point of view, uh, allow me, from a philosophical point of view, well, things become a little bit more uh, problematic. Trust is a form of delegation with no control, just to put it bluntly. Uh, we used to think of trust as a, a relation in and on itself. Uh, Alice trusts Bob, uh, and they are in a trust-based relation. It's not exactly so. Trust is a way in which relations occur. Uh, Ellie trusts Bob to tell the truth. So between Alice and Bob, there is a relation, but the relation is the one of communication, which happens in a trust-based way, which means that Ellie trusts Bob to deliver truthful information and will not control the way in which Bob uh, has acquired or has transmitted that information. So it's these two elements, a delegation and the lack of control on the delegated task that really qualify um, uh, trust. Among rational agents, uh, as in the case, for example, of uh, those who might deploy AI, uh, trust is based on the assessment of the trustworthiness of the trustee. Uh, and trustworthiness is a key element here. Being trustworthy uh, means having been assessed, having been measured, as it were, against two parameters. One is the predictability of the behavior of the trustee. I know that Bob has always told the truth, he will continue telling me the truth. Um, so in this sense, trustworthiness is uh, based on the reputation of the trustee, is based on the past history of the trustee. We take the past history of the trustee to be a projection of the future behavior of the trustee. Keep this in mind because it will be important um, later on. And then there is another measure, which is the risks that the trustor, uh, Ellis, uh, runs should the trustee behave differently. There are contests in which Bob telling the truth might determine my, the, Alice's safety, um, Alice's success. Um, in other contexts, Bob telling the truth or not might not pose real risks to Alice. This measurement of the risk um, uh, have a strong weight, have a strong importance on the decision, importance of the decision of Alice to trust or not Bob in that contest, to consider or not Bob trustworthy in that contest. Now, when it comes to AI, a particular, particularly problematic problem um, point is um, to assess the predictability of the behavior of AI systems. It's very problematic to predict that the system will behave as it has been behaved so far, also in the future. And this is because AI is not uh, really a robust technology. It is indeed quite fragile. It's very much a vulnerable technology. There are different ways in which AI can be um, attacked. Um, and for the purpose of um, this talk today, I'll focus on just on three, one, but, um, on three ways, but the literature is uh, really, really rich uh, uh, in, this, in this area. So the first form of attacks that AI can suffer from uh, is data poisoning. It's very easy to introduce even a small portion of erroneous uh, data in the data set used to uh, train a given model to make sure that the model, uh, the system we are considering, we're behaving in a different way. Um, there's been a study um, which showed that uh, attackers could um, target an AI system used for drug dosages. And just by introducing 80% of erroneous data into the system, the result was that for half of the patients who were relying on the systems to receive their drugs, the quantity, the amount of the drugs received was completely wrong. Another form of attack has to do with um, tempering uh, of the categorization models. Uh, AI learns by comparing, especially comparing uh, categories as you were. Uh, and it's also very easy to trigger AI into categorize something for something else uh, by changing the, the kind of um, association on which AI learns. So in a famous study, a study um, uh, some researchers were able to provide a picture of a particularly carefully 3D printed turtle and make sure that the AI system will start categorize turtles as rifles as a consequence of it. 
And the third kind of attack has to do with backdoors. Uh, Backdoor-based uh, attacks rely on hidden association, the so-called triggers, uh, which are added to the AI model to override the correct specification and make sure that the system will be in an expected way um, once the trigger is uh, activated. Also in this case, there was a famous study uh, that showed how um, a backdoor could be inserted in an AI system so that the system would categorize as speed sign limit uh, particular uh, mm, sign stops, uh, stop signs, which would present a sticker on it. Um, the experiment uh, was controlled, but imagine if that would have been uh, the case, an attack of these sorts targeting autonomous uh, vehicles on our, on our streets. Now, there is a passage here which is very important. When it comes to AI, att attacks have shifted strategy, as it were. They've gone from extracting uh, data from the system or disrupting, disrupting the way a system will work to acquire control of the system to make sure that the system will behave according to the attacker's intention. If we add this to the case or use of AI for cybersecurity or self-defense, well, we'll start seeing where the problem uh, might, come, uh, might come from. There is a solution to this, uh, and the solution is to push for robust AI, to have AI systems which are very resilient, which can um, keep behaving as they are expected to behave, even when they are presented with erroneous um, data or erroneous input, um, and so that whose behavior remain predictable. And pushing for robust AI is what's happening um, at the level of international standards, where there are standards being defined with respect, for example, to the robustness of neural networks. Um, this is part of a research project um, defined by DARPA, GART. Um, developing robust AI was a core element uh, mandated by the US executive order on AI last year, and even China as um, with this uh, Electronic Standardization Institute um, defined three working group to support the development of robust AI. All fine from a, uh, let's say, a political point of view, much more problematic when we look at robustness uh, from a technical point of view. Assessing robustness requires foreseeing in an exhausting way all possible erroneous input that a system might receive. And then being able to measure the divergence that the related outputs to the uh, erroneous inputs might have from the expected, one, expected ones. But when it comes to um, uh, AI, this is very problematic for, um, a few, for, a few, for a few reasons. The first one is that attacks on AI can be very much deceptive. A backdoor can be inserted in a neural network, and we might never know that it was there uh, if we are the owner and not the attacker until the backdoor is activated, until the trigger is activated. In some cases, if the change of behavior is not too big, it's not too dramatic, we might not even know that the system is behaving because of the trigger or uh, because of the um, conventional or the legitimate input. AI, system are not, um, AI systems are not transparent. It's very hard to understand what is actually determines a given outcome. So it's very hardly hard to uh, identify whether a behavior is the expected one, uh, should be considered the expected one, or is actually being determined by some sort of uh, malicious um, attacks or some, some malicious tampering with the system. And finally, AI systems are vulnerable because the number of possible perturbation to which they are open is astronomically large. Um, if you think about, for example, um, image recognition, well, the source of perturbation goes down to the pixel level. So it's actually uh, unfeasible to think that we can identify all possible sorts of attack. AI robustness is not an impossible task, assessing and developing robu robust AI, but it's a computationally intractable probe. So it's something that is very, very much uh, unfeasible to achieve. But if AI is not robust, it means we cannot predict its behavior. And if we cannot predict its behavior, it means that we cannot assess whether AI is trustworthy or not. And this is why we cannot trust AI for cybersecurity. Pushing for trusting AI in cybersecurity is conceptually misleading and is also operationally dangerous because it paves the way to um, uh, new forms of attacks and to um, uh, higher and more severe uh, risks. And this takes me to the last part uh, of the talk, uh, because so far one may think, well, there are a lot of ethical problems with AI. 
uh, AI is not trustworthy. We cannot make it trustworthy because we cannot make it re um, robust. Are we perhaps saying that we should forego AI, that we should uh, forget about it, go back to the uh, manual work? Uh, we don't need any assistance in this, assistance in this context. That would be uh, uh, equally wrong uh, and misleading, I should say. The solution is to shift our approach, to shift our um, way we to understand and deploy AI systems based on the very much, very much on the understanding of AI as a technology and on the ethical issues that it brings uh, with it. So AI robustness depends as much as on the input with which the system is fed, as much as it is with the interaction of other agents once it is deployed and um, with, from the uh, design and training uh, elements. So what we need to do is to take into account this kind of dynamic and self-learning nature of the systems start thinking about designing form of control and monitoring the span from the design to the development stage. We should start thinking about some form of controls which is not uh, stop, stopped or uh, altered at the development uh, phase of the design, develop, deploy cycle, but actually goes end in end with the use uh, of AI systems. We need to switch, in other words, from a trustworthy AI so an AI system which, to which we delegate a task and do not control anymore the execution of the task, to a reliable AI, which means uh, a system that is technologically uh, able to perform a cybersecurity task in this context successfully, but whose deployment comes with very much high, with very high risks, um, uh, that their systems might behave differently uh, from what we expected. And so to combine uh, reliable to combine a technological ability or technological um, uh, uh, success with mitigation of the risks, what we need is to have new forms of control or monitoring over the execution of the delegated task of a given system. Uh, and so, uh, in a uh, paper published in Nature uh, Machine Intelligence a few months ago with uh, Tom McCutcheon and Luciano Floridi, we um, came up with um, three suggestions which could enable this shift from reliable to trustworthy AI, especially when focusing on um, cybersecurity uh, tasks. The suggestion um, uh, referred to ensure that AI models for cybersecurity are developed in house, um, which means that in many cases, AI is developed using uh, what is called a machine learning for service. Uh, one can buy a data set, one can buy models, one can combine the two things together. Relying on these external sources um, maximize the opportunity that attackers will have access to uh, training data and to models, and so they, might can, they, they can, they, they can uh, perform an attack on our system. Making sure that the system is developed in house does not brush away all the possible sources of attacks, but reduces the surface of attacks, makes it for attacker a bit harder to, um, to target and successfully reach uh, our systems. The second suggestion has to do with adversarial training. AI learns and improves through cycle or refinements, uh, uh, where to which it adjusts its coefficients um, uh, from time to time. And adversarial training uh, helps a lot in this context. And so adversarial training has become uh, a practice in many, many um, circumstances, what we lack are clear standards on the level of refinement of the adversarial model. The more refined they will be, the harder the adversarial training will be, the more uh, resilient the, our system will result in the end. And so agreeing on this standard is a, a crucial element, a crucial aspect of developing AI for cyber uh, security. And the last aspect has to do with uh, parallel and dynamic monitoring. As we say, uh, AI keeps changing, keeps learning, keeps adapting uh, once it is deployed. And at the point and stage, uh, it can be attacked, attacked um, and change its behavior unexpectedly. A way to mitigate to this, this risk is to make sure that we can maintain an eye on the way AI behaves, perhaps establishing a um, uh, baseline in another contest and keep matching um, the behavior of the system against the baseline to ensure that there are not too big uh, divergences and if there are we can intervene uh, promptly and just to conclude um, and to uh, end where we started um, at the beginning of this talk i said well ai is a growing resource of interactive or uh, interactive autonomous and self-learning agency and if this is the case uh, we can use ai for sure in cybersecurity 
to support uh, cybersecurity practices. But to do so, we have to rely on approaches that make it reliable, not transformative, so that we can maintain some form of control on the tasks that we delegate to this technology while the technology performs the same, same tasks. It's something that is being stressed also in the uh, OECD principles for AI, and particularly um, this one, which says AI, system, AI system, systems must function in a robust, secure, and safe way throughout their life cycles, and potential risks um, should be continually assessed and managed. And making AI, AI reliable as a way of delegating tasks, so keep using AI, but controlling the way these tasks are being uh, performed is a key uh, way to uh, respect uh, these principles. So with this, I'll thank you very much. Um, uh, I should say that uh, this research has been developed within the context of the Digital Ethics Lab, which is a very vibrant research uh, group within the OAI. And uh, thank you again for uh, tuning in, listening, and I look forward to uh, the debate and the discussion with Andreas. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tadeo, for a fascinating talk. Uh, it's it's really uh, you're, you're de describing a seismic uh, shift in the landscape of uh, cybersecurity. So uh, there is a lot to unpack uh, here. We already have uh, a lot of uh, very interesting questions uh, in the chat. I'll just remind every participant that uh, there is a Q and A uh, bottom at the bottom right of your screen. Uh, where you can ask your questions. We'll try to get over everything. Uh, I, I just wanted to start things off uh, with a uh, um, question regarding the uh, requirements that you uh, state uh, uh, at the end of your, uh, you stated at the end of your talk. So regarding monitoring uh, those uh, AI systems, I'm assuming that for the human operators, uh, behind it, uh, there needs to be a certain degree of explainability uh, integrated uh, in the system. So uh, if that's the case, um, do you expect national defense agencies to have to decide at some point between prioritizing system effectiveness over system interpretability for the operators or vice versa? And if that's the case, um, how can they settle that dilemma? I mean, the, 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 the uh, conundrum, as it were, or the, the balancing off of explanation or explainability and effectiveness is, is a key one. Uh, and I think that to some extent, uh, there is a need, if not so much for explanation, for explainability of this, of this process, of intelligibility of these pro this processes in any possible way. But when I think about um, AI for cyber defense in particular, um, when I look and refer to monitoring, uh, I'm actually thinking about something a little bit different that perhaps allows uh, to maintain both control and efficacy of the systems without sacrifice one or the other. The idea is that, um, and, and the premise is, is an idea that, that has quite an impact on resources of a company. So it's something that I don't expect any possible company in cybersecurity to deploy, but it's something that reduces a lot of the risks of using of AI for cybersecurity. So especially in high sensitive context, it should be um, something to, 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 to embrace. The idea is that while we implement an AI system in the world, um, we also implement the same system under very strict and controlled condition, and we keep the two systems running. The system that runs uh, under stricter control uh, condition offers the benchmark, kind of the baseline of the expected behavior of the system. We know that that system cannot be attacked. And then we're trying to compare the behavior of the controlled systems with the one uh, in the wild. Uh, and if there is any divergence, we can agree, I think, in policy terms of the level of the divergence, that flags a problem. Uh, which then requires further scrutiny. And I think that's a technical solution that allows us to escape the dilemma, explanation versus uh, efficiency, uh, which might take much more time to be uh, addressed successfully, I'm afraid. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Uh, I'll start taking uh, some more. Uh, oh, and we got also the results from uh, um, the poll we started uh, at the beginning. Um, pretty interesting uh, answers. So, uh, do you trust technology? The uh, 
64% uh, have uh, said yes. And would you trust AI to maintain key infrastructure secure? 64% said no. So uh, uh, we can, uh, you can maybe comment uh, on those uh, with the next question. Um, so I'll pick, um, I'll pick uh, uh, not in order the, the, the questions. Sorry if I butcher every, uh, anyone's names, I'll, I'll do my best. So we have a question from uh, Eugenio. Um, it was mentioned that one of the benefits of AI is to improve systems response. Uh, does this mean that AI has also the potential to improve the accuracy of attribution? Not really. So AI is, uh, for what we have seen, in, in, for example, in the cyber, uh, in the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge, um, AI is able to identify the source of an attack, the server, the machine from where an attack has been launched, uh, and that's as far as it goes. Attribution requires is, is a political action, uh, mm. and so it requires a, attaching the machine or the attack, as it were, to a specific actor and to do that with absolute certainty so that states can, can respond to it. This is not something that the AI uh, does uh, and attribution requires a lot of intelligence, diplomatic work, a lot of mm. uh, awareness of the geopolitical situation. So I doubt uh, AI might offer any significant advantage on that point. But AI kind of allows us to decouple the, the source of the attack from the attacker. And this is an important uh, distinction because once we can identify the source of the attack, it means we can respond against that source. Uh, and in that sense, we can punish the attacker, whoever the attacker is. And this might enable some forms of deterrence, for example. Great, great, thank you. Uh, uh, we have uh, our next question. How to determine appropriate robustness um, of AI ML models before deployment? Um, uh, it seems more. Uh, it, it seems uh, quite subjective, non-technical. Uh, uh, you can keep on working on incremental improvement uh, indefinitely. Agreed. You can do that, and I think one of the key points is that uh, is the appropriate uh, is the threshold. Um, when it comes to cybersecurity, I don't think that appropriate uh, has anything to do with total robustness. Uh, anything less than total robustness. So whether that is at all possible, uh, mm. I mean, it's plausible, it is possible, it is unfeasible uh, for the reasons we discussed during the talk. Um, uh, the most popular question now is uh, from, uh, from uh, John Moulton. Uh, would your proposed parallel and dynamic monitoring mean having a human on but not in the loop? I think that you will have some way of a human on the loop in the sense that you will have some form of intervention when between the two systems there is a difference which is bigger than the threshold which we, we might have uh, agreed upon or has been agreed upon. So there has, has to be some kind of form of uh, human on the loop. When it comes to cyber, and we, we've been talking about forms of cyber attacks in this context, so most likely non-kinetic uh, cyber attacks, so attacks that originate in cyberspace and ends in, end in cyberspace with no physical damage. Well, in this context, having a human in the loop is very problematic because actions and responses are very, very quick uh, and mm, to be meaningfully controlled at human level in that context. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, as we saw before, an attack can take ages. In so far, a backdoor can be stalled on day one and then be triggered uh, uh, on day 5,000. Uh, yeah. So having a human on the loop, uh, sorry, in the loop for all the time, it's not really uh, effective or efficient. Mm -hmm. So both stream don't call for a human in the loop. Okay, especially as the technology develops, uh, it will be more and more difficult, uh, I imagine. Uh, the, the next question is from uh, Christoph uh, Garska. Um, so to what extent do you think we should push for uh, a lack of AI in certain sectors of cybersecurity? as opposed to developing robust, reliable AI? Uh, is this guarded approach defeated by the threat of uh, countries' alliances being overtaken by rivals on the uh, international arena, or the threat of cyber criminals relying on AI? So there is another phenomenon which is going on uh, on the side, not on the side, but in parallel, which is a cyber arm race. Uh, mm -hmm. Aggressive or offensive capabilities 
AI-based offensive capabilities are available on the market, basically. Uh, legitimate or non-legitimate market, but it's there. Uh, and this is a market where legitimate actors, state actors, but also non-state actors are uh, participating in it. Uh, so cyber defense cannot, uh, or cyber security cannot be blind to the threat that comes from AI. And I'm afraid that responding to the threat that comes from AI requires AI capabilities. Uh, it, it, not all the times, but on the, on the average, yes. Because you will have to be able to act quickly with precision and uh, digesting a lot of information. Uh, to be able to identify targets and strategies. Mm -hmm. So if defense has to maintain a technological advantage with respect to offense, and if offense is going into the context of AI, defense cannot. Uh, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Um, uh, which is a, an issue that is uh, uh, currently facing uh, every uh, cybersecurity uh, expert and practitioner. Um, so th the next question is from uh, Ekin. Um, could transparency be an ethical principle on its own? Uh, do you agree that if something is morally suboptimal, um, transparency just makes what is wrong clear, but it won't turn it right or correct? So, technically speaking, transparency is an ethical enable, enabler. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's something that makes ethical consideration easier, uh, ethical problems easier to identify, ethical solutions e easier to uh, assess. So it's like trust. Trust in itself is not a principle, it's not a value, it's an enable. Uh, it makes good actions easy to, uh, to, to, to occur. It also it makes bad actions easier to occur. Uh, trust is a key value, for example, among uh, organized crime. You need to trust the people of your group. Mm -hmm. So trust is not in and of itself a good thing. And so is transparency. In so far as we have to understand transparency, what, to whom, and for what reasons. So yes, if uh, AI is something that is uh, uh, morally problematic, transparency help to make sure the ethical problems emerge and to address them. It's not sufficient in and of itself. Of course. Um, uh, the, the next question is from uh, Kate David. Uh, great question. So it's, uh, she says that philosophers in the analytic uh, uh, traditions um, have models of trust uh, from ethics and ep epistemology grounded in idealized human to uh, human information transmission. Uh, but human to machine trusts, machine to machine, and machine to human trust may produce uh, quite asymmetric uh, uh, normative relations. For example, self driving cars uh, need to be far more reliable than human drivers. So uh, what grounds trust in machines rather than uh, people? So I'm guilty as charged uh, in terms of being an analytical philosopher with a model for trust. Um, the question is whether we, 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 we're using different names for the right reasons. We say we trust a driver and we rely on a machine, for example, uh, because we're focusing that on two different kinds of, uh, two different kinds of relations. Um, the trust that we have in humans, uh, if we really are not abstracting and so not focusing on uh, fully rational economic agents, the trust that is loaded with uh, emotional, historical, and uh, non-objective uh, or rational aspects. Uh, and it comes loaded with moral uh, connotation as well. With the machine or with an autonomous vehicles, it's not really trust. Uh, we're delegating a task. We might not be controlling it the way the machine performs directly, but there are in place, or we want to have in place, forms of checks here and there. Standards, certifications, they are a form of maintaining control. They are not uh, uh, a way of waiving control. It's a form of making sure that the machine does what it says on the thing, on the thing as it were. So these are different relations, and uh, I like the fact that she used different names for these different relations. Mm -hmm. I think that is the answer to that question. Um, so uh, we have a question from Mark Mann. So uh, your talk focused uh, uh, maybe more on the defensive uh, uh, side of uh, use of AI systems. Mark uh, asks, how do you think AI can impact or shape cyber operations conducting um, intelligence or uh, surveillance? Uh, it, it does, it does, uh, it does a lot. Um, uh, in terms of surveillance, um, 
monitoring the behavior of a system or a system for communication, for example, well, that's one of the most straightforward implication or uses I can think. But AI is also being used, for example, to um, monitor, surveil, and identify terrorists uh, in other contexts. Not exactly in the most precise way, but that's a news that is emerging. Uh, the point is that AI is very good at digesting big amounts of data and find relevant information. And this is where surveillance work, right? Uh, is acquiring a lot of data and then trying to map uh, so that we can identify the information we need. Uh, in the context of cybersecurity, there is another level, which is abstracting from the identification of the specific subject and reconstruct what is called the social graph, reconstruct the interactions among subjects to understand big trends that might pose risks to the order of a state, for example. Mm -hmm. And the AI can be uh, uh, a powerful tool, uh, collecting information from social media, from any sorts of habit we might have, and then develop categories which might support state intervention. Um, and this raises a lot of problems, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, um, we have quite a few questions on uh, accountability. Um, I just want to mention also that uh, on the last question of the poll what is the biggest risk of using AI for cybersecurity? 51% um, of uh, participants uh, uh, clicked on lack of accountability compared to 22 uh, for deception and uh, 26 for lack of transparency. So uh, I, I clicked on the same, um, I agree. Um, we have uh, one question from uh, 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 Maria Vasquez. Uh, maybe you want to uh, address also the accountability uh, uh, subject uh, before, but I'll ask the question. Um, the role of uh, standards in making AI robust was mentioned. Uh, her question is, who decides which standards should be used or which are better than others and under which parameters, for instance, in uh, government procurement? Yeah, indeed, that is a very uh, good question. It's a very, it's a very hard question to, to, to mm. answer. So the process of definition of standard, uh, standards is very complex and is political, is technically technical, and is also very distributed. Um, the standard I mentioned on the robustness of neural network is a standard that's been in the making for almost a year, just to give a sense, or more than a year. Um, there are processes in place. Um, uh, the European Union, for example, mandated uh, ENISA, which is the uh, security agency, to define certification processes uh, for robust or, or, or the use of AI for cybersecurity. Um, and and the, the decisions of the parameters, I should say, is something that requires reconciling uh, political aspects with engineering aspects uh, uh, and with the assessment of effective security, uh, security risks. I think that's a very much of a, an abstract model. I would imagine that then there must be other forces into these processes, but uh, speculation is not the business of a critic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have a question from uh, Paul Timmers. Um, and I'll take uh, maybe a few more uh, afterwards. I, I don't want to bombard you with, uh, with everything. Um, so parallel and dynamic monitoring may not be easily compatible with uh, privacy if applied at uh, uh, the level of devices that people use, which you mentioned uh, uh, before. Uh, perhaps a more relevant issue for AI um, is in health medical devices than in electricity systems. Um, uh, even if dynamic monitoring already exists to an extent uh, in health. Thanks, Paul. Uh, um, so the, the in general, yes, I mean, any sort of mo monitoring uh, uh, requires at least asking ourselves the questions whether we're breaching on uh, individual privacy. The one that I was specifically considering uh, might not be, because we're not monitoring the behavior, sorry, we're not, not monitoring the transition or the actions within the system uh, or the specific system. We are just comparing the behavior of a system with another system. And what we're monitoring is the divergence between these two behaviors. If something is wrong, then yes, we will have to intervene with the, within the system. But then that's another problem because uh, I would imagine that we would have procedure to uh, decide how to intervene, what kind of, uh, in which way, how to alert users and to make a proportional response between risks uh, and uh, individual rights. 
but um, yeah, not, I would say that it's not a previous is not a particular problem from the solution I'm uh, advocating here. Mm -hmm. um, um, from uh, Vardas, um, could you please comment on value alignment problem uh, with AI for national defense? So you, you kind of covered it uh, already before, but. So uh, there is only one side of the value alignment problem I'm going to comment on because the other falls within the realm of sci-fi and I'm not good at it. Um, uh, AI remains a tool. Uh, it's a tool which is autonomous, is a, is a tool that can improve by learning, is a tool that is offering much many, much more opportunities that we would have, uh, have had with any other tools, but it's a tool. Uh, mm. And this means that Going back to the accountability question, it remains responsibilities of politicians, of uh, high level officers, of uh, policy makers to make sure that the use of these tools aligns with the values of these societies. So this is where policy needs to have regulations, need to have a strong uh, uh, guidance mm -hmm. to how this technology is used, to foresee risks, to foresee opportunities, and to make choices. Uh, for example, to decide that some uses of AI are so much against the values of our societies that despite the advantages that they might bring, we will not use it. Uh, that's a call that politicians, that political leadership need, uh, need to make. That's the only side of value alignment I'm, uh, I'm going to comment today. Great, great, thanks. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll take one more questions, uh, question and then I, I think we can uh, end it. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Tadeo. Um, so it's from uh, Emma Tudos. Uh, thank you for a very insightful uh, talk. I was just wondering if you have any specific examples of the kind of controls uh, that would make AI more reliable. Uh, so you mentioned uh, a few in your talk. Uh, likewise, uh, you also mentioned that in-house development would be a way to gain more control over AI. But how would you balance that with the advantages of using AI tech firms for commercial uh, uh, partners like Amazon, Google, uh, which have maybe lower costs, quicker turnarounds, uh, and such? Okay, uh, that's a very nice question to, to end the talk. Um, uh, Managers goes from in-house development, but also adversarial training, uh, not to mention the proposed parallel um, and constant monitoring that I was suggesting. So some of these measures are already in place. Adversarial training is already there, uh, for example. It is true that all these measures that I mentioned, these suggestions, they have a strong or a big impact on cost and resources of a company. Uh, and they might actually create uh, an imbalance uh, between opportunity, of opportunities between companies in the sectors, uh, SMEs versus big tech. Yeah. There are two answers there. The first answer is that when the use of AI is um, proposed or embraced for particularly sensitive tasks, like the security of key infrastructure, mm -hmm. well, the balance between the risks and the opportunities uh, is very much, uh, let's say, of tipped toward the risks. Mm -hmm. And so it justifies uh, paying more uh, resources and attention to ensure that the system is robust. And if a company cannot afford that, perhaps it's a company that cannot play that game. On the other side, um, I advocated somewhere else that maintaining security of all digital infrastructures for our societies is part of the public interest and cybersecurity should be considered public good. So this could be an occasion to think about how public institutions can support uh, companies within the cybersecurity um, realm to make sure that they can improve their robustness uh, or mm -hmm. their standard. I'm thinking about IoT, where most of the competition is on the cost of these devices and most of the uh, cost uh, is uh, actually, uh, let's say, uh, mitigated on the security side, where we buy devices which are not really secure, but they are very cheap. Yeah. It's going to be a problem, uh, a massive problem. So cybersecurity is something which is part, which is in, within the public interest to foster, and is actually a public good. Uh, mm -hmm. So we should call on public institutions to uh, support and foster uh, SMEs in this area to make sure that they can live up to the standard. Yeah. Um, IoT, especially with uh, most issuers uh, never updating uh, past the first year uh, of the device being sold, uh, is uh, is going to be an immense problem in the following years. 
Um, great, uh, Dr. Tadeo. Thank you so much for for uh, your uh, fascinating talk. Thank you to everyone who uh, asked uh, uh, questions. We are taking, uh, we are copying every uh, question that has been asked. We'll try to also uh, give uh, some answers and uh, some more context uh, via email to all participants. Um, I think we can uh, maybe uh, end it here for today. Yeah, let me just join you and say thank you to everybody who, who listened to the talk today and stay with us. Uh, and thank you very much to you to like time from precious time from all the other tasks uh, to, to have me here today. I really appreciate it. And thank you again, Isabella and Flora. Um, have a good yeah. afternoon. Yeah. Thank you, Rosaria and Andreas, for a fascinating insight today. And thank you all for attending. Uh, you will receive a follow-up email in due course. The OII are hosting our next webinar on Wednesday the 10th of June at 1pm British Standard Time where Dr Sandra Watcher will discuss why fairness cannot be automated, bridging the gap between EU non-discrimination law and AI. Please visit the events page on the OII website to sign up. Thank you again and have a wonderful day. <laughs>